Welcome to JSA TV and JSA Podcasts, the newsroom for telecom and data center professionals. I'm Jean-Marc Lim and joining me today is Ward Hampton, who is helping digital infrastructure investors and their portfolio companies to find, hire, and retain data centers actives globally. Um, Ward, thanks so much for talking to JSA. Um, I mean, you're a digital nomad. I think you, I believe you're really far away at the moment. Um, it's how, how you've been doing over the last two years. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm great. Thanks, Zhao. I'm, as you rightly point out, I'm currently nestled about 10,000 feet above sea level in the uh, Peruvian Andes. Uh, I've been here since, uh, since May. Um, I launched my business in just over two years ago now. Um, yeah. and yeah, it's, it's, it's been, been really successful so far. Um, yeah. really capitalizing on, you know, there's just a tremendous growth in the uh, data center industry over the last few years. Hmm. It's amazing. And I mean, talking about running away from COVID, you couldn't have gone any way further. <laughs> um, yes. Yeah. And to be honest, sometimes around here, it's so remote, I, I can sometimes forget there's a pandemic going on, which is quite yeah. good. Which is amazing because that does not happen in this side of the world. I can tell you that, especially now. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, but we'll talk about the business in a second. Um, in terms of recruitment, what would you say are the biggest challenges um, in today's marketplace when it comes to, to finding talent? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, well, I'd, I'd say if we look at the recruitment life cycle, we can very broadly sp split that into two categories uh, of candidate attraction and candidate assessment. Um, and if, if I look at the, the, the attraction piece, that has never been more important, you know, particularly in such a high growth, buoyant industry such as data centers, which has had, let's face it, it's had a talent shortage for a number of years already. Um, so it's never been more important to develop for companies to develop a really strong employer value proposition to ensure that they stand out ahead of the competition. Um, you know, when they're trying to attract suitably qualified people into a hiring process. Um, and, you know, I'd, I'd say this is definitely a problem that transcends the data center industry, but in general, companies tend to struggle when it comes to marketing their job opportunities. Um, I think most tend to use a job description as a job advert, which, um, you know, they might a little clumsily add exciting opportunity at the front end of, hoping that's going to be enough. And unfortunately, in, in today's market, that just isn't enough. Um, let's face it, you know, job descriptions are quite often quite dry, boring, overly formal documents, which generally contain a huge long list of demands that are entirely centered around what the company's looking for. Um, and it, that's not the right way to attract people who aren't looking for a role. You know, we need to start creating job adverts and job copy, which is really geared towards what's in it for the candidate. You know, that's, that's marketing 101 really. Um, we need to put job adverts and job copy together, which is used in outreach to candidates to make it attractive enough to someone who is otherwise happily employed, um, but um, is open to considering a new opportunity if it can better their current circumstances in some way. So, you know, I, I have a team of copywriters who really nail this and it has a huge impact on the number and quality of people I'm able to attract into hiring processes. And then, now the, the the other aspect, the assessment process, then I think generally companies don't tend to train their managers how to assess people, or, or if they do, it's not a huge focus. Um, and you know, there's there's a three year study by Leadership IQ uh, which found that forty six percent of all hires fail within eighteen months. Which you know, that, I think that tells us we've got a quite a big problem when it comes to assessing, onboarding, training, and managing new hires. Um, so I think another challenge is that there's a real overemphasis on assessing experience. You know, uh, experience can be very important, um, but we seem to treat it as though it's directly proportional to competence, um, which if we think about it, we all know isn't true. Um, it, it's, it's the competencies and character traits that are the most important drivers of success. And we need to help equip hiring managers to be able to assess beyond experience and get at these things. And, and I think 
companies who can do this can get a real competitive advantage by opening up the talent pool into adjacent industries. Um, uh, and again, you know, from this point of view, I, I bring in business psychologists at the front end of the process to put together an assessment process which enables hiring managers to do this. Um, that, that, that's very interesting because um, it really shows a shift in the recruitment world, um, going from almost a tick boxing exercise um, to really thinking about the, the, the people they are trying to target. Um, and, and I love the idea about the copywriting and viewing it as, almost as a marketing exercise. Um, it goes beyond marketing, but treating it differently from just copy and pasting a template from Google um, and um, going out and looking for people. Absolutely, Joe. And, and, you know, the front end of a recruitment process is definitely, absolutely, it's a sales and marketing exercise if you want to yeah. attract people into the process who aren't actively looking for a new job. So, yeah. yeah. So especially nowadays with so much information online, I mean, you can go online and see how a company behaves and acts even before you join it. So um, there's a lot of considerations the employee, employers need to take um, when going out and recruiting someone. Uh, but you, you've also mentioned the, the, the talent shortage and you mentioned quite a lot um, in, in the answer, but my other question would be, so taking into account the talent that we've already got in the industry, um, how would you kind of describe the talent that we've got? Do we, do we, yeah. I mean, are we lacking a lot of um, skills? Are we, do we need to renew <laughs> some of mm -hmm. the, 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 the sectors um, of our industry? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, well, I, I think it's different from market to market. So, you know, if I look at what I've done over the last six years in this space, I've, successfully delivered assignments in 13 countries and, and five continents. Um, but there's there's definitely some some clear trends. Um, and I would also say, you know, one of the things I love about working with developers and operators of data centers is the variety of technical disciplines which are found within those organizations. So, you know, I've helped companies to hire into functions across the full life cycle of a data center build, whether that's, you know, land and power acquisition, design, build, operations, right through to sales. Um, you know, and, and as, as well as up to CEO level, you know, people who are managing the entire P&L of a business. Um, so it's, it's different in, in different markets, but you know, the, the number one word that springs to mind when you ask me that question is definitely short. You know, the, and, and, the, and the biggest, the biggest challenges at the moment, which you know, are, are pretty well known, already is attracting more young people um, to the industry and also you know improving gender diversity by attracting more women into the sector too. Um, <clears throat> we've all we've all read that survey from a few years back I can't remember who it was from maybe data center dynamics which found that the average data center manager was a 55 year old male mm. um, and I think the fact that you know many of these guys are approaching retirement age you know, really compounds this problem and so we definitely need to put together strategies to start to bring in more young people and recruit from more diverse talent pools not only from a gender point of view but as i touched on earlier you know if we can help and equip managers to be able to assess candidates who have developed competencies in adjacent industries then we can really open up the talent pool. And that's something that I think we need to really have a have a big focus on over the next mm -hmm. few years. I mean, there's so much that we can learn um, from other industries that have been around for so long and are much more mature. Um, it, it could be quite incredible. That, uh, and I'm curious to see once events fully come back. We've had a, a taste, a bit of a taste of events over the last couple of weeks, couple of months. Um, and there seems to be like a few new faces around and younger faces as well. But um, can't wait to see like when the events really come back and you start going out and be like, oh, all right. Um, if you don't know half the room, that's a very good thing. Yes, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's the on yeah, days, you, whatever you went in the world, it would always be the same people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, yeah. But um, and then, Ward, from what you've been working on, um, so let's say over the last twenty-four months, how have you seen um, requests and interest changing um, mm -hmm. from the people that you work with? Because um, we've already touched on a lot of change, but how, like, why are people asking for that's different from before? Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I, I think for me personally. Um, you know, I am incredibly niche, so I, I maybe don't have as holistic a view on on the industry as mm. as some others. But you know, because I only work with developers and operators uh, and the investment funds who back them. I don't work with the supply chain of the industry, um, and I'm even more niche within that these days because I, I really 
prefer and enjoy to work with companies that I'd describe as startups or, or, or scale ups. And that was a that's been a strategy of mine over the last few years when I saw, you know, the amount of new private equity firms and infrastructure funds who were looking to uh, diversify away from some of the more traditional real estate asset classes and focus on the data center industry, which is, you know, outperforming other assets, other, other asset classes from an ROI point of view significantly. Um, so, yeah, and, and, and again, I, I like to get involved at investor level, at C level, where I can work in a truly co consultative way, you know, and, and really add value across the full uh, life cycle of the, of the recruitment process. Um, and, you know, a lot of the time, these investors or, or early stage platforms, they're, they're looking for senior leaders who've got significant data center experience um, and an entrepreneurial mindset. Um, and I often find these executives in more mature businesses, sometimes ones that have grown really quickly, either through organic development or through M&A. And there may be, you know, if, if, if that exec's been in that company for a number of years, the whole organization has changed considerably. And, and you know, some of them might be looking for something that's a little bit less bureaucratic, a little bit less, less red tape, less internal politics, um, and, you know, more autonomy, ability to work at, with a bit more speed and agility. Um, and, yeah, and, you know, you know, people who want to look back on their career in a few years' time and think, I really played an integral role in building a business from near scratch or, or from scratch. Um, and obviously, you know, if, uh, if, if these people are getting significant equity holdings in these organizations, then if they get to exit, then it, we, we can be talking life-changing sums of money as well. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, My answer to all that's like, don't we all, don't we all, don't we all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and yeah, and, and just the, the second part of your question, that's not going to change for me. You know, there's the amount of capital coming into the industry is, is what, phenomenal at the moment and more and more investors turning into to this asset class. So they're the people I really, they're the companies I really want to help most. Yeah, we, we definitely got a very long way, um, a very long, longer, long road ahead. Um, when it comes to investment in this space and um, the new types of investors coming in as well. It's quite interesting. Um, almost on a, every two months, there's a new type of investor coming in. Um, so it's it's very, very interesting. And um, I think the next five to 10 years, things are going to change a lot. Um, yeah. And that'll be an industry for everyone. There's, there's the beauty of it still. It's There's still an industry for everyone and they're still going to be for a very long time. Yeah, we're all in the right space at the moment, Joe. Definitely. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah the, the children and the grandchildren can then deal with finding another niche. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, yeah, yeah. Uh, but Ward, you only really work um, on a retained basis as well uh, within mm -hmm. your business. So why should companies take the retained option over using multiple um, agencies um, on a contingency basis? Because this seems to be the standards that people usually go yeah. for. Yeah, 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 you're absolutely right. I would say that is the, the model that most companies um, tend to adopt. Certainly at operator level tends to be a bit different at um, investment fund level. Um, but I suppose the, the first thing I'd say is that not everyone should. You know, there, there is still a place for contingency recruitment, but in, in, my, in my view, not for the senior level business critical hires that, that I get involved in. Um, it's, it, it's pretty widely accepted that the average contingency recruiter only fills around 20% of the jobs that they work, uh, which is, you know, it's not really a good advertisement for the industry. Um, but but I'd, it's also important to say that, you know, the, the mere fact of paying a retainer isn't going to improve things. But the search methodology of a, of a really good retained recruiter will be radically different to that of a contingency recruiter. and. In, in my experience and my view, so will, so will be the results. Mm -hmm. um, I think one of the biggest problems with contingency recruitment, especially when there's multiple agents working on the same role, uh, is that you know, what, what should be a really organized and well thought out search, which is based on quality and good process mm -hmm. is 
usually devalued to what I describe as a disorganized race based on speed. Um, and you've got multiple agents who aren't fully committed to the process. And, you know, for the more challenging roles, when, when the going gets tough, they'll often give up and focus on easier assignments where they've more chance of getting a fee. So, I mean, if I compare that to what I do, like I'm really low volume. So I, I only work on one, two, maximum three assignments at any one time. Mm -hmm. um, and because I know the company is committed to the process, committed enough to pay a retainer, um, it means that I can be fully committed in terms of time and starting to spend cash on the search from, from day one. Mm -hmm. um, and this, you know, this approach has been really successful for me. I've, I've successfully completed 100% of the retained search assignments I've handled since launching the business. Um, and, and some of the additional things that I'm able to invest some of that retainer back into that a contingency firm wouldn't be able to are things like bringing in business psychologists to design the assessment process, uh, using outsourced researchers and sourcing professionals to fully map markets globally, um, working with the professional copywriters I've talked about earlier. Um, that's, that's really, that really helps, you know, persuasive and compelling job copy has a huge impact. Um, and again, you know, the business psychologist can also um, handle psychological assessments and even going on to the onboarding stage. So, you know, a lot of most contingency recruitments, their job ends once the hire is made, whereas I like to really get involved in onboarding. Um, so for clients who want it, I, I will pay for an executive career transition coach to work with the new hire and the line manager or, or the board. Um, and that's with a git, that's with a aim of really improving retention rates and also, you know, fast tracking success in the role. Yeah. That's very interesting because I mean it, it really changes from the, the churning um of applicants and recruitment into something a bit more bespoke. Um, which we've we've seen in other industries. I mean, even in just in the consumer space, we've seen companies shifting from just churning things and products um into just becoming more bespoke and actually serving the needs. Um, and the follow-up is very important, especially in the, the, the digital industry, uh, the digital age. Um, it's always about the follow-up, that um, support, that upgrade that comes after um, after something is bought, found. Um, we, we, it's a very interesting approach to recruitment. Yeah, yeah. And look, I, I'm, my whole philosophy is geared around helping people to hire long-term successful employees, not just you know, making a placement. So, yeah, that's... Hmm important to me interesting uh, and what you've also rebranded recently um mm -hmm. and you made use of your name which is quite unique uh, at least <laughs> i don't know any other word in the world so um t tell us about the rebranding i mean what sparked it what uh, what's the end product what, what are people reacting like linkedin seems to like it but yeah. um what, what's been the yeah. feedback as well yeah um well i suppose if there was an award going for the least creative business names then <laughs> I, I, I mustn't be far off because i've gone from data center recruitment to, to Ward. Um, but, um, you know, joking aside, the, the, the rebrand was, was prompted by the fact I hired a consultant to go out and interview all of my clients and get feedback from them on exactly, you know, what their experience had been like of working with me so far um, and how I could improve, you know, parts of the business as well. Um, and, a lot of the feedback coming back from the investors that I work with was that they would love it if I could help them and provide them with the same level of service, but in other areas of their business. Um, so whether that's helping them find investment professionals with digital infrastructure experience to work fund side, or, you know, opening up in the future to be able to help their tower companies or their um, fiber portfolio companies. Um, so look, uh, the specialism of the business is still very much data center focused. Um, but, uh, the reason I, I removed data centers from the name of the business was that long-term I do want to open up into these, uh, into these other areas. Um, so yeah. Future proofing the business. Um, and then uh, as we start a new year, what, what can we expect from, um, from the word forward? Is it? Um, well, my, my website is the way of ward, um, the way of ward, sorry. Yeah. 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 Um, uh, yeah. So 
Well, I suppose I'll, I'll, I'll probably answer that from the perspective of what I expect to see in the industry um, and, and then where my focus is going to lie. So um, I think we all know competition for everything is going to continue to intensify. Um, from working with investors on a day-to-day -day basis, I know there's going to be lots more M&A. You know, I've, I've, uh, I've recently arranged, for example, I've recently arranged for a very talented C-level exec to help uh, an infrastructure fund on some commercial and technical due diligence on a business in Europe they're hoping to acquire. Um, the competition for land is also increasing. I was speaking with an MD in India recently. He said land prices there um, that were appropriate for data centers had increased by 40% in the in the last year alone. Um, I think we'll continue to see the hyperscalers self-build, but also to, to outsource, you know, they, simply because they can't keep up with demand. And particularly in some of those more challenging territories that they're looking to enter or expand in where they maybe don't have the local expertise or, um, you know, a significant uh, existing presence. <clears throat> Uh, and another thing I'm seeing is uh, a lot more, a lot of the more traditional real estate developers, um, particularly those who uh, work in the logistics space, who have a lot of land banks, a lot of good access to power, um, and the added advantage that they can underwrite these this land with alternative use, uh, are, are starting to move into this space as well. Um, you first and foremost, with the view to building powered shells, um, which the end tenants will then fit out themselves. Um, so, yeah, everything's getting more competitive. Obviously, competition for talent will will also intensify. Um, and yeah, I mean, for, for me in 2022, you know, I'm going to keep doing what I'm doing in terms of remaining very niche. Uh, really focusing on helping the infra funds, the PE firms to hire at executive level. Um, and I've started to bring a lot of the outsourced support and project teams that I use in-house. Um, so I've recently hired a full-time researcher based out of India who's, who spends 40 hours a week continually mapping the market globally, segmenting everyone in within the industry into their functional expertise, which again, gives me a real head start when it comes to working on specific uh, projects. Um, and and I'm, I'm just about to make another offer to someone uh, today who's gonna provide a lot of support from an administrative and um, social media marketing point of view as well. Well, okay, so it's really growing um, and it's, you've got a, a nice little future ahead <laughs> over next year, yes. year ahead. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I don't have any, motivations to build a huge business, but I, I would definitely like to, well, I am definitely scaling, um, but I, I want to keep it really niche, uh, boutique, high quality focused business. Yeah. yeah. And it, and again, I think one of the, one of the areas from working in agency recruitment for you know, 12 years prior to setting up my business, I think one of the mistakes that a lot of those companies make is just scaling really quickly and the, lose the focus. Yeah, lose the focus and, and the, the, the it's always a focus on finding the next client and the service towards existing clients tends to, tends to suffer. Hmm. No, no, absolutely. I completely, completely agree. Um, and it's, every sector should be doing a bit more of the boutique um, side of things. Even if you're a large corporation, you should probably start adopting a bit more bespoke um, approaching ways of dealing with people. Uh, but then what, if people want to reach out or learn more, where can they go to? Uh, well, I'm I'm pretty active on LinkedIn, um, and that's that along with referrals is where most of my relationships originate. Um, so, so if you if you log on to LinkedIn, you'll you'll probably see me around there somewhere. Uh, and uh, also, you know, my new website which I launched, uh, which is thewayofward.com. Okay. Well, what. Thank you so much. Um, I can't wait to see how um, how the business develops as well over the, the, the next few months and years. Um, I'm sure it's going to be successful and um, we'll see where you're going to be talking to us from next time. I don't know if it's going to be 10,000 feet above sea level, but <laughs> we'll see where you yeah. are when we get to it. Uh, so thank you so much. And uh, thank you, our viewers as well, for tuning into JSA TV and JSA Podcasts. And don't forget to check our social channels for more content. Until next time, happy networking.